From the moment I could understand my father's words, I knew he'd always longed for a son. Instead, he got me, Jennifer, and my younger sister. Dad was an ophthalmologist, a damn good one too. But he had bigger dreams. When I was about five, he opened his first eyeglass store. I remember the day clearly, the smell of fresh paint, the gleaming displays, and Dad's proud smile as he cut the ribbon. As the years passed, Dad's business grew. He took out a loan, opened a lens production facility, and before we knew it, he had a chain of stores across the state. By the time I hit high school, Dad's company was a proper empire, 30 stores, and a high-tech manufacturing plant. I threw myself into my studies, determined to make Dad proud. While other kids were hanging out at the mall or going to parties, I was nose-deep in textbooks or helping out at one of Dad's stores after school. Every day after school, I'd head to the store, learning everything I could. How to handle customers, manage inventory, even basic bookkeeping. I was determined to prove myself. My sister, on the other hand, couldn't care less about the family business. She was always off in her own world, paintbrush in hand, creating these wild, colorful masterpieces. Dad tried to get her interested, but it was like trying to teach a fish to climb a tree. Jennifer, my dance teacher said one day after class, you've got real talent. Have you ever thought about pursuing dance professionally? I hesitated. Truth was, I loved dancing. The freedom, the expression, the pure joy of movement. But I pushed the thought away. Thanks, Miss Davis, but I've got other plans. As high school came to an end, I applied to college for finance and management. Economics and finance didn't come naturally to me like dancing did. But I gritted my teeth and pushed through. Late nights, endless cups of coffee, and more spreadsheets than I care to remember. Meanwhile, my sister breezed through art school, met a guy, and got married right after graduation. To everyone's surprise, her new husband started working for dad's company. The day I graduated college, I felt a mix of relief and determination. As I walked across that stage, diploma in hand, I could see dad in the audience, grinning from ear to ear. This was it. I was ready to take on the family business. As I stepped off the bus in my hometown, the familiar sights and smells washed over me. It felt like nothing had changed, but everything was different. I was different. No longer the wide-eyed girl who left for college, but a woman with a degree and a purpose. Dad was waiting for me, leaning against his car with that proud smile I'd always longed to see. Welcome home, Jen, he said, pulling me into a bear hug. Ready to get to work? I nodded, determination stealing my spine. More than ready, Dad. The next few weeks were a whirlwind. Dad started me off in accounting, dealing with primary documentation. It wasn't glamorous, but I threw myself into it with gusto. Every invoice, every receipt, every ledger entry was a step towards proving myself. Years passed, and I climbed the corporate ladder. Deputy Chief Accountant, that was my new title. I was helping Dad with budget planning now, feeling like I was finally making a real difference in the company. My brother-in-law, Tom, was rising through the ranks too. Dad made him head of the supply department, and man, did that guy know how to schmooze. Dad loved him, treated him like the son he never had. I tried not to let it bother me, focusing instead on my own work. But I couldn't help feeling a twinge of jealousy every time I saw them laughing together in Dad's office. Then came the day Dad called me into his office. My heart was pounding as I sat down across from him. Jennifer, he said, his face serious. I've been thinking. You've done great work in accounting, and I think it's time for a change. I held my breath, hoping against hope that this was it, the moment I'd been working towards all these years. I'm making you manager of our retail chain, he said, smiling. And Tom? He's going to be my deputy at the Lens Factory. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. Manager of the retail chain? It was a step up, sure, but it wasn't what I'd been hoping for. And Tom, he was now second in command at the factory, the heart of our business. Thanks, Dad, I managed to say, forcing a smile. I won't let you down. 
As I left his office, I couldn't shake the feeling that no matter how hard I worked, I'd always be playing second fiddle to Tom. Weeks went by, and I threw myself into my new role. I was determined to prove that I could do more than just crunch numbers. But then, something strange happened. I was reviewing a new shipment of glasses when I noticed some discrepancies in the documents Tom had provided. The numbers didn't add up, and something about the quality felt off. Hey, Tom, I said, catching him in the hallway. Can we talk about these documents for the new shipment? Some things aren't quite clear. He barely glanced at the papers. Everything's fine, Jen. You're probably just overthinking it. His dismissive tone rubbed me the wrong way. This wasn't just about me anymore, it was about the integrity of our business. I decided to dig deeper. I went to the head office and requested a quality check on the latest batch of lenses and glasses. Something wasn't right, and I was going to get to the bottom of it. I was sitting at my desk, reviewing the quality check results, when Dad burst into my office. His face was red, and I could practically see the steam coming out of his ears. Jennifer, he bellowed. Who gave you the authority to order quality checks? You're overstepping your bounds, young lady. I took a deep breath, trying to keep my cool. I noticed some inconsistencies in the documents for the new shipment. I was just trying to. To what, he interrupted again. To show everyone how smart you are? To undermine Tom's work? His words stung. No, Dad. I was trying to protect our company. If there's something wrong with the products. Enough. He slammed his hand on my desk, making me flinch. You don't have the authority to give instructions to the company or arrange inspections. I'm the head of this company, not you. Do you understand? With that, he stormed out, leaving me standing there, feeling small and stupid. For days after that, I went through the motions at work. I did my job, nothing more, nothing less. The passion I once had felt like it had been sucked out of me. Then, one evening, Mom called. Jennifer, honey, she said, her voice excited. Your father's decided to retire. We want to throw him a party, and I was hoping you could help organize it. I felt a mix of emotions, relief that Dad was stepping down, anxiety about what that meant for the company, and a petty part of me that wanted to refuse just to spite him. But in the end, the part of me that still yearned for his approval won out. Sure, Mom, I said. I'd be happy to help. As I planned the party, an idea struck me. Dad had always loved jazz. What if I could get his favorite band to play at the party? It would be expensive, sure, but seeing the look on his face would be worth it. I called Mom to run the idea by her, and she agreed enthusiastically. We decided to split the cost, I, Mom, and Sarah and Tom. I called Sarah next. Hey, sis, I said. I've got an idea for Dad's retirement party. What do you think about getting his favorite jazz band to play? There was a pause on the other end. I don't know, Jen, Sarah said hesitantly. Sounds expensive. Let me talk to Tom about it. I waited anxiously for her response. Hours turned into days, and finally, Sarah called back. Sorry, Jen, she said, not sounding sorry at all. Tom says it's too expensive. We can't chip in. In the end, Mom and I split the cost ourselves. It was a stretch for my budget but I was determined to make this party special for Dad. The night of the party arrived, and the venue was buzzing with excitement. The place looked fantastic, if I do say so myself. Soft jazz played in the background as guests mingled, waiting for the main event. As the evening progressed, the moment I'd been waiting for finally arrived. The lights dimmed, and the first notes of Dad's favorite jazz band filled the air. I held my breath, watching Dad's face. His eyes widened in disbelief, then filled with tears. He stood there, transfixed, as the music washed over him. I've never seen him look so genuinely happy. I can't believe it, he whispered, his voice choked with emotion. They're here. They're really here. I felt a warmth spread through my chest. This was the moment I'd been working towards. 
I opened my mouth to tell Dad it was my idea when Tom suddenly appeared at Dad's side. Surprise, Dad. Tom said, clapping Dad on the shoulder. Sarah and I thought you'd like this little treat. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. I took a step forward, ready to set the record straight, when I felt a hand on my arm. It was Mom. Jennifer, honey, she said quietly, her eyes pleading. Let it go. Don't spoil the moment for your father. I wanted to argue, to shout the truth from the rooftops. But looking at Dad's happy face, I couldn't bring myself to do it. I swallowed hard and nodded, forcing a smile. As the night wound down, Dad took the stage for a speech. I perked up, hoping that maybe, just maybe, he'd acknowledge my role in organizing everything. Family, Dad began, his voice thick with emotion. Family is everything. And tonight, as I prepare to step away from the company I built, I'm filled with gratitude for the support you've all given me. I smiled, waiting for my name to be mentioned. But more than that, Dad continued. I'm filled with hope for the future. Hope that this company will continue to thrive for generations to come. And that's why I've made a decision. It's time to pass the torch. I straightened up, my pulse pounding in my ears. This was it. All those years of hard work were about to pay off. Tom, Dad said, turning to my brother-in-law with a proud smile. I'm making you the new CEO of the company. The room erupted in applause, but I couldn't hear it over the roaring in my ears. Tom? He was giving the company to Tom? Not only that, Dad continued, oblivious to my shock, but I'm also entrusting our entire chain of eyewear stores to Tom's capable hands. I felt like I was going to be sick. This couldn't be happening. It had to be a nightmare. After Dad's announcement, I approached him, my voice barely above a whisper. Dad, what about me? He looked at me, his expression a mix of pity and condescension that made my blood boil. Jennifer, sweetheart, he said, patting my shoulder. You're a woman. Which means you're a priori stupid and incompetent in management matters. You don't understand anything about running a company. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. But Dad, I've worked so hard. I dedicated my life to this company. He waved his hand dismissively. I know, I know. And that's admirable. But let's face it, you've always been more interested in dancing, haven't you? Now you can pursue that without worrying about the company. Leave the business to those who can actually do it. Without another word, I turned and walked away. I grabbed my coat, ignored my mother's concerned calls, and stormed out of the restaurant. As the cool night air hit my face, I finally let the tears flow. A couple of hours later, I was already packing my bags. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I had to get away. Away from the family business, away from my father's crushing disappointment, away from Tom's smug face. My phone buzzed. It was my sister, Sarah. I almost didn't answer, but something made me pick up. Jen? Sarah's voice was irritatingly chipper. Where are you? Dad's looking for you. He wants to know when you're planning to serve the cake. Tom's got a sweet tooth, you know. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. After everything that had happened, they were worried about cake? Tell your husband to figure out the cake situation himself, I snapped. He's the big boss now, isn't he? I hung up before she could respond. With my bags packed and my resignation letter emailed to HR, I left town. I ended up in a city a few hours away, determined to start fresh. It wasn't easy at first. I landed a junior position at a large auditing firm. The work was challenging, but I threw myself into it with everything I had. No more trying to please anyone but myself. Years passed. I climbed the corporate ladder, earning a reputation as a skilled and dedicated auditor. The firm gave me increasingly difficult and interesting cases, trusting my judgment and expertise. And in the evenings? I danced. I found a studio near my apartment and started taking classes again. It felt like coming home, like rediscovering a part of myself I had buried for far too long. I barely spoke to my family during this time. Occasional calls with mom, sure, 
but we kept things superficial. I didn't ask about dad or the business, and she didn't volunteer any information. Life was good. I had a high-paying job I excelled at, a beautiful apartment in a nice neighborhood, and I was finally pursuing my passion for dance. I felt free, truly happy for the first time in years. Then, one evening, everything changed again. I was walking home from dance class, my body pleasantly sore from a challenging routine, when I saw her. Sarah was standing outside my building, looking lost and disheveled. Jennifer, she called out, her voice trembling. I need your help. How did you find me? I asked, my voice cold. Sarah looked down, ashamed. Mom gave me your address. I, we need your help, Jen. Tom's in trouble. The company, it's being audited by the tax authorities. And, and your firm is conducting the audit. I felt a chill run down my spine. I had a feeling I knew where this was going, but I let her continue. We need you to influence the results of the audit, Sarah pleaded. Just, just tell them everything's fine with the accounting. Please, Jen. We're family. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Are you seriously asking me to commit fraud? To risk my career, my reputation, everything I've built here? Sarah nodded desperately. I'll pay you. A hundred thousand dollars. Please, Jen. We're desperate. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. Tom had screwed up, big time. And now they wanted me to cover for him, to jeopardize everything I'd worked for. This conversation is over, I said, pulling out my phone. If you ever suggest something like this again, I'm calling the police. Sarah's face crumpled. She placed a hand on her belly, and I noticed for the first time that she was pregnant. Please, Jen, she begged. Think of your niece or nephew. You wouldn't want them to grow up without a father, would you? I felt a surge of anger. Your pregnancy doesn't change the fact that your husband is a fraud, I spat. Now leave, before I call the cops. Sarah's demeanor changed instantly. She started screaming, hurling insults at me, causing a scene right there on the street. Passersby began to stare, some pulling out their phones. I'd had enough. Without another word, I turned and walked into my building, leaving Sarah screaming on the sidewalk. A month passed after Sarah's unexpected visit. I threw myself into work, trying to forget about the whole ordeal. But fate, it seemed, had other plans. One evening, as I was reviewing some files for a particularly complex audit, there was a knock at my door. I wasn't expecting anyone, and for a moment, I feared Sarah had returned. But when I opened the door, I was shocked to see my parents standing there. They looked older, more tired than I remembered. Dad, once the picture of confidence, now seemed small and defeated. Mom's eyes were red-rimmed, as if she'd been crying. Jennifer, Dad said, his voice barely above a whisper. Can we come in? We, we need to talk. Hesitantly, I let them in. We sat in my living room, an uncomfortable silence stretching between us. Finally, Dad spoke. We've come to ask for your forgiveness, he said, his voice breaking. We've made terrible mistakes, and we've wronged you deeply. What followed was a confession that left me reeling. Tom, the golden boy, the son my father never had, had been running a massive scam for years. He'd been buying counterfeit lenses cheaply from South Asia and passing them off as expensive branded products through our chain of stores and pocketing the difference. He'd been siphoning money into offshore accounts for years. As they spoke, a memory surfaced. Years ago, when I'd noticed discrepancies in Tom's reports and tried to investigate. Dad had shut me down, accusing me of overstepping. Now, I realized just how right I'd been. The consequences were devastating. The subpar products were causing allergic reactions in patients. Lawsuits were piling up. The company that my father had built from the ground up, the legacy he'd been so proud of, was now teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. We were blind, mom said, tears streaming down her face. We didn't want to see what was right in front of us. Dad reached out, tentatively taking my hand. Jennifer, 
we know we have no right to ask this of you. But, we need your help. The company needs you. Will you come back and take over? You're the only one who can save it now. I stood there, my parents' plea echoing in my ears. For a moment, I was tempted. The challenge of saving the company, of proving once and for all that I was capable, it was alluring. But then, like a flood, all the memories came rushing back. I remembered the disappointment in my father's eyes when I was born, not the son he'd always wanted. The countless times he'd dismissed my ideas and efforts. The way he'd so easily handed over the reins to Tom, calling me incompetent and stupid. The years I'd spent trying to prove myself, only to be cast aside. And now, here they were, asking me to swoop in and save them. To sacrifice everything I'd built for myself, all for a company that had never truly been mine. I looked at them, really looked at them. Despite the current crisis, they were still well off. They had money, they had resources. This wasn't about survival, it was about pride. My father's pride. His legacy. In that moment, I made my decision. No, I said, my voice firm and unwavering. They both looked shocked, as if they couldn't believe what they were hearing. I'm not ready to forgive you, and I don't want to communicate with you anymore. Where was all this concern when you were calling me incompetent? When you were handing over my birthright to Tom? You didn't think about me then, did you? My father tried to interject, but I wasn't finished. And now, now that you're in trouble, suddenly you remember me? Suddenly I'm capable enough to run the company? No. I won't do it. I won't sacrifice everything I built here, to save your pride. My words hung in the air, heavy and final. I saw the hope drain from their faces, replaced by a mix of regret and despair. But, but it's your legacy too, my father said weakly. I shook my head. No, it's not. You made that very clear when you chose Tom over me. This is your mess. You clean it up. My mother was crying now, silent tears streaming down her face. Part of me wanted to comfort her, but I steeled myself against it. I'd spent too many years trying to please them, trying to be what they wanted me to be. No more. I think you should leave now, I said, moving towards the door. They stood slowly, looking lost and defeated. As I watched them walk down the hallway, looking small and pitiful, a part of me ached. But a larger part felt, free. For the first time in my life, I had put myself first. Months passed, and life moved on. I heard through the grapevine about the fallout from my family's crisis. Dad had taken the reins of the company once again. It wasn't easy, but slowly, he was rebuilding the reputation he'd spent a lifetime creating. Tom wasn't so lucky. Fraud, tax evasion, embezzlement, the list of charges was long. He ended up behind bars, his offshore accounts frozen, drowning in fines, and debt. Sarah, now a single mother, had moved back in with our parents. I heard she was struggling to adjust to her new reality. Sometimes, I felt a pang of sympathy for her and her child, but I reminded myself that she had made her choices. As for me? Well, life had a funny way of surprising you when you least expect it. It happened one evening at the dance studio. I was lost in the music, my body moving freely to the rhythm, when I noticed him. A man with a camera, capturing the dancer's movements. There was something about the way he looked at the world through his lens, that intrigued me. After class, he approached me. Hi, I'm Alex, he said, his smile warm and genuine. I hope you don't mind, but I got some great shots of you dancing. You're really talented. We got to talking, and before I knew it, hours had passed. Alex was a freelance photographer, with a passion for capturing moments of pure joy and freedom. As we parted ways that night, he hesitated for a moment. Listen, Jennifer, he said, a hint of nervousness in his voice. Would you like to grab coffee sometime? Or dinner, maybe? I surprised myself by saying yes without hesitation. That was the beginning of something beautiful. Alex and I started dating, and with him, I discovered a side of myself I never knew existed. He encouraged me to be more open, more free-spirited. 
Through his eyes, I saw the world in a new light. Our relationship developed naturally, without pressure or expectations. We enjoyed each other's company, shared our passions, and supported each other's dreams. For the first time in my life, I was with someone who saw me for who I truly was, not for who they wanted me to be. One evening, as we walked hand in hand through the city park, Alex turned to me. You know, Jen, he said, his eyes twinkling. You've changed since we first met. You're more, you. More open, more free. It suits you. I thought about his words, about the journey I'd been on. From the dutiful daughter trying to prove herself, to the woman who stood up for herself, to now, someone who was learning to embrace life with open arms. You're right, I said, returning his smile. I do feel different. Freer. Happier. As we continued our walk, I reflected on the twists and turns my life had taken. The pain, the disappointments, the hard decisions, they had all led me here, to this moment. I wasn't the person I thought I'd be all those years ago, working in my father's company. I was someone better, someone true to herself.